kind of like, oh, I don't know, taking the time to stop, be still, be patient, to maybe work a little harder, <coughs> even a little faster to get things done in my day so that I can stop what I'm doing long enough to pray, you know, to be still and appreciate sometimes the things that are going on around me, to consider my ways, to examine myself, to look at the Word of God and see if it fits for me today of what it may say, whether it be for good or for teaching, whether it be a lesson or a blessing, whether it be an encouragement or an exhortation, whether it be a word to change or a word to rearrange my life and my schedule. That's what makes me a man with God. I'm not a man of God, but I am a man with God because I trust in Him to talk to me. I look forward to Him walking with me. I rely on hearing Him speak to me. Because if I didn't, my faith would be in vain. I would have nowhere to go and nothing to turn to unless I be a man with God. And that's why I have to trust in Him so much. So, because if I didn't, I couldn't be really who I am today. There's nothing about me that's good that wasn't directly involved in His making me into that goodness that some people see. My nature isn't like that. I usually tell people, hey, leave me alone for five minutes and I'll sin. It's not so true anymore, but in respect to what I used to be like. Oh yeah, no problem. Because I was well aware of my own sin. But you see, that's why we stop now to look at the Word of God. That's why we take the time, sometimes at lunch, morning, noon, and night. You know, a Jewish way of looking at it was, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night, when thou risest up, when thou sittest down, when thou eatest, when thou sleepest, when thou goest forth. In other words, there's always in your mind, there should be that time where you're kind of thinking about these things, considering your ways, applying the wisdom or the experiences of your life into the Word of God so that you become that life that God says is pleasing in His sight. We can only do that by looking to the Word of God. We can only have that by applying His Word to our life. Because we could make up our own way of doing things and we deceive ourselves. But if we stop long enough to come to the light, as Jesus said, to be examined inside that light that He's given us, to open up, as it were, the spotlight of God's Word, and to look at ourselves, not each other. It's no problem to ask someone to tell you how bad you are. As a matter of fact, I imagine you have plenty of friends that could tell you how bad you are, and very few that could tell you how good you are. I personally like the friend who can tell me how bad I am and proffer to me or offer to me a way of dealing with it. Those are my kind of friends. I haven't had many of them like that, but I've had a few. And they greatly influenced my life. <laughs> Romaine was one of them. <laughs> but other people too. You know, I think of a man named John Lingy who really, big impact. Another man up in Alaska who was a pastor that was on a rotating basis. He was pretty, pretty interesting person, you know, big impact. But always I've had to turn to the Word of God 
to Jesus himself to really get to the heart of my condition. To really deal with not the symptoms of what's going on in my life, but the root cause of what's going on inside of me that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be healed or changed or made new or removed from my life. Because only God could do it. I can't. I could never change myself to make myself good enough or to even get away with it for 24 hours. Nah. <laughs> the good that I would not, I do not, and that which I would not, I do. O oh, wretched man, who can deliver me from this body of sin that I live in? And it's true. No one can. I can't. You can't. You can't put yourself into a deprivation sensory tank and think that you won't sin because your mind wanders. But Jesus can. And he does it through the Word of God, which is alive and working in you. It's a sharper than a two-edged sword, able to cut asunder from the body, from the soul, and the flesh, you know, the bone from the marrow, to really get to the heart of the matter. It's like a scalpel. It's like an orthoscopic surgery. It's kind of like, you know, being able to really be God in us. And so we look at the Word of God each day to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith, of the faith, and by the faith that God has given us to live by, to grow by, and to know. The fruit of the Spirit is love. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwells in God, and God in him. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Unto you which believe he is precious, we love him because he first loved us. The love of Jesus constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You yourselves are taught of God to love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Walk in love, as Jesus also loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Love isn't simply acceptance. Love isn't simply patient, kind, gentleness, meekness, kindness, and temperance and all the first Corinthians thirteen. No, it really isn't. Love is a choice. Love is a action and direction of the Holy Spirit to cause something to interact in your soul, to create this ability to love as God loves, to be able to love in and of itself to the point of causing a person to change in the way of what they are to what they can become. Because when they are loved, they can receive correction, chastisement. They can receive a word that's not pleasant to hear in their ears, but yet is beneficial to their soul and their spirit. When they are loved to such a degree, when you spend that time together to grow in that love, then you trust the person that's doing it to you. Jesus has done that to me, and in the same way that he loves me and has comforted me in the times that I need to be comforted and chastised me in the ways I needed to be. Likewise, I see that as we do for each other. Because I don't have a problem with loving anybody. They just don't realize it, which amazes me. But if I didn't love them, I wouldn't deal with them. Because believe me, I could walk away and do so many other things. But instead, I choose to tell the truth in love, to be honest about what's going on in my heart and yours, to be seeing those things we see in the world and saying, no, wrong. Or even if there's like little worms, you know, on my plant, and the plant just thinks that, you know, it's fine doing okay until I cut off a branch because it's wormy and it's got bugs on it. Or that I have to transplant it because it's overgrown. Or I have to prune it because it's got so much blossoms it needs to be transplanted. Those don't feel good at times, but that's what love does. It grows the plant up as best it can be grown in its container, in its place, in its time, in His will. 
Jesus loved us enough to die for us, but he didn't love us to the point of leaving us where we're at. He loved us so that he could send the Spirit of God to us so that God would change us into the image of his Son. Now that's love. Not leaving me the way I was, but giving me someone who is changing me into the way I will become. That kind of love is the love I enjoy. Maybe you too. Let us love one another in truth, but also in action and deed. In honesty, but also in word and in follow through. When I share with a person, and sometimes they say, Oh, you're not loving me, brother. I say, Really? Have I deleted you? Have you been removed from my sight? Have I somehow attacked you personally? Or have I said to you, the facts of what you're doing or the facts of what you're stating is wrong. And that you can do whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, and that I'll support. But if God doesn't tell you to do it, I see you falling into a pit, so yes, I will grab you by the collar and hang on to you, lest you fall into that pit of your own making. When we love one another, we care enough for each other to listen, yes, and proffer correction, yes, but at the same time to release them unto the Lord our God, yes, and to pick them back up every time they fall down from doing their own thing, no matter how many times they offend you. Love has to be loved. Love is only love if it's challenged, and it has to be challenged in order to prove what kind of love it is. It has to be tested and tried by fire. People that say, I love you, Normally, I don't believe, because I don't know them. But when I watch them and I see how they interact with me, then I know what they speak of and whether their word for love <laughs> is the same as mine or the Lord's. God loves me, and he loves you. He's bringing us to that unity of the fellowship of the saints and the unity of the body of believers as one in God. But the closer we get to God, there's only one way to get closer to each other, and that's a triangle. Make a triangle or make the letter A. Pretend you're at one leg, one, one leg of the letter A, and I'm at the other leg of the letter A, and you have to keep moving upward. If you'll notice, as we move upward, until we hit the point of where God is, we're not together, but we're getting closer together. And that's the way that love should be. We should be looking at God to love each other. As I look at God and I look through him downward to you, I see you from his perspective. As you look upward to God and look downward through him to me, you see me from his perspective. When you look at it that way, I think we see each other as perfect. Don't you?